Hello, and thank you for joining me for this talk as part of the MUTOR Extended Lecture Series on the History and Practice of Multimedia Performance. This lecture series is part of MUTOR, the Music Technology Online Repository, and it's supported as part of the Hamburg Open Online University uh, in affiliation with the Hochschule for Music and Theater Hamburg. So I would like to thank Professor Dr. Georg Haidu and Dr. Xiaofu, as well as the entire MUTOR extended team for inviting me to take part and hosting this incredible series. And it's also a pleasure to share this evening with Dr. Kirsten Evert. Uh, my name is Tioma Nakarado, and I'm a freelance choreographer and dance scholar presently based in Berlin. And the topic of this talk today is dance, interaction, and virtuality in contemporary performance. The full transcript, including video links and works cited, is also available on the MUTOR website if you want to follow along that way. So I will dive in. In the field of contemporary dance, projects involving technology are often referred to under the general framing of dance and technology. The niche of dance technology encompasses multimedia practices variously described as interactive, digital, and mediated, and is not easily defined in temporal or geographic scope. Narratives that trace the role of technology in dance frequently center a particular canon of European and American choreographers in the genres of ballet, modern, and postmodern dance, whose work has been archived and disseminated by a large-scale collaborations with technologists and scholars. In part, the emphasis on Euro-American concert dance in published accounts of multimedia performance reflects an asymmetrical distribution of access to technologies, such as professional motion capture systems, as well as the institutions in which these technologies are used. Presently, as the field of dance endeavors to confront the ongoing effects of cultural and aesthetic appropriation in the legacies of 20th century choreographers and more broadly in movement techniques and vocabularies to present day, dance projects that integrate multimedia are not immune to these concerns. And in fact, they may amplify ethical concerns related to abstraction and representation. In a recent book titled Perpetual Motion, Dance, Digital Cultures, and the Common, Harmony Bench acknowledges a gradual shift in her thinking about dance and digital media over the years. Bench writes that, quote, when I began thinking and writing about dance and digital media, I was very confident about the dance forms represented. For the most part, what I saw came from the same lineages of ballet, modern, and postmodern dance in which I had trained for decades as a performer. Digital dance was a niche phenomenon, and participation was a mark of privileged access to the enabling resources and technological infrastructures that enabled high-profile collaborations between choreographers and technologists, seen, for example, in Paul Kaiser and Shelley Eshkar's large-scale collaborations with choreographers Merce Cunningham, Bill T. Jones, and Tricia Brown. With few exceptions, there was a wide gulf between serious artists developing new technologies to support their aesthetic investigations, and amateurs posting animated GIFs of dancing hamsters online." End quote. And yes, I have a dancing hamster for you here. But in all seriousness, like Bench, my background is in contemporary dance and choreography, and the high profile collaborations she refers to above are key to what I imagine, and or at least what I initially learned to imagine when thinking about multimedia dance performance. A select list of choreographers, such as Merce Cunningham, Bill T. Jones, Wayne McGregor, and William Forsyth, are frequently centered in discussions of dance and technology, due in part to their involvement in research and creation initiatives that have been mobilized by scholars to advocate for the value of dance and choreography, uh, both within and beyond academia. So arguably a major motivation for the use of technology in the realm of dance has been and continues to be uh, its potential to reveal aspects of studio practice and create a process that are otherwise invisible to audiences. And further to facilitate the transfer of dance-based and choreographic knowledge across disciplinary boundaries. 
the need to make the value of dance and choreography legible to the institutions that grant access to resources has both ethical and aesthetic consequences. Given sustained capitalist and neoliberal pressure, the who, how, and what of dance has become increasingly entangled with the integration of new media as a means to demonstrate knowledge born of dance and choreography. All this said, the adoption of technology into dance is not only a matter of necessity, but also one of curiosity and desire. So historically, and to some extent presently, the integration of interactive and sensing technologies in dance owes much to developments in fellow performing arts forms, such as theater, music, and film. In the book, Entangled, Technology and the Transformation of Performance, Chris Salter provides a considerable review of advances in multimedia performance from the late 19th century onwards, illustrating cross-disciplinary spillage between various art forms, as well as disciplines such as engineering, computer science, and architecture. Casting a similarly wide net, Johannes Bieringer has published several books that address enduring themes in multimedia performance, such as virtuality, interaction, embodiment, immersion, and augmented realities. Uh, relatedly, in digital performance, Steve Dixon discusses the role of computer technologies in multimedia performance over the course of the 20th century, interrogating notions such as liveness, digital doubles, cyberspace, and telepresence. And on the theme of telepresence, Susan Kozel's book, Closer Performance, Technologies, Phenomenology, intertwines philosophy and photography, as well as experiential accounts from performers herself included, to dig into the aesthetic and ethical concerns in responsive and interactive environments. So this is a small collection of resources that speak to the history or these historical narratives about technology in the realm of dance and multimedia performance. Uh, notably, however, in the mere decades since the books I just mentioned were published, the arena of dance and technology has transformed dramatically. The proliferation of low-cost devices for recording and biosensing, in tandem with user-friendly software and social media platforms, has reconfigured access to and participation in digital culture. In the context of the pandemic, myriad dance artists are turning to dance for camera and live stream performance, devising distributed and durational choreographies that echo and expand on developments in multimedia since the mid-1960s. With this swell of virtual dance encounters, the urgency of questions related to presence, proximity, mediation, and materiality is palpable and prominent in the framing of special issues for journals, as well as symposia and conferences uh, world round. So more recent publications on dance and technology emphasize the collaborative uh, DIY and open access character of ongoing projects, which tend to blur boundaries between process and performance, as well as personal and professional. Um, so you can see, for example, Poesis and Enchantment in Topological Matter from Xiaoshen Wei, 2013. Also, the performing subject in the space of technology, and, uh, Perpetual Motion from Harmony Bench, I just cited above, and finally, uh, a new book by Johannes Beringer, Kinetic Atmospheres. Uh, additionally, the online platform dancetech.net, uh, which was founded by Marlon Barrios Solano uh, back in 2007, but remains active. This is um, a good place to get involved and exemplifies this shift towards widespread uh, international engagement with dance and technology, even as asymmetry in access to technology certainly persists. So from high profile collaborations featuring established choreographers to the present overflow of digital interventions in dance, questions related to interactivity and virtuality are still at the foreground. And having offered a few resources on the field of dance and technology at large, in the remainder of this talk, I will draw on particular examples to elucidate ongoing aesthetic and ethical concerns in multimedia research and creation. I will focus first on bodily abstraction and representation in motion capture for dance, looking at the work of choreographers Merce Cunningham and Bill T. Jones in collaboration with the Open Ended Group. Next, I will present 
research-based and archival projects aimed at the transmission of dance-based and choreographic knowledge across disciplinary boundaries, uh, again, largely through the use of motion capture uh, as well as annotation technologies. And finally, I will consider the shifting landscape of dance and technology in light of ongoing artistic, economic, and political forces world round, pointing towards current resources and platforms for critical engagement. So as I've mentioned, from the 1990s onwards, several notable motion capture projects were developed by the open-ended group comprising Mark Downey, Paul Kaiser, and up to 2014 Shelley Eshkar, in collaboration with well-established contemporary dance choreographers such as Merce Cunningham and Bill T. Jones. The excerpts from many of these projects are available online. Uh, you can see, for example, uh, hand-drawn spaces from 1998, iPad from 1999 and Loops from 2001, developed with Cunningham, uh, and then Ghost Catching from 1999 and After Ghost Catching from 2010, developed with Jones. Now, overall, the work of Cunningham and Jones differs both aesthetically and thematically, I think most people would agree with me here. Uh, and yet, in these motion capture videos, the abstract skeletal representations of moving bodies bear remarkable resemblance. And if you take a moment to watch hand-drawn spaces and ghost catching side by side, let's do this with the volume off uh, for, for logistics, um, just consider um, what you see in terms of similarity and difference between the movement of these skeletal figures. So while there are certainly differences in the movement vocabulary and bodies of the performers, these differences are less pronounced than in live performance. The emerging of an overlapping aesthetic here may be attribut attributable in part to having the same design team as well as similar hardware and software for motion capture and animation in each collaboration. And indeed, many choreographers use the same or similar motion capture systems. Uh, and the extent to which this colors the aesthetic and conceptual outcome warrants interrogation. Of particular concern here is the political significance of obscuring differences in representations of human bodies and movement. In an article titled Ghost Catching, an Intersection of Technology, Labor, and Race, dance scholar Danielle Goldman raises concern regarding the political implications of the erasure of bodily and identity markers in motion capture systems. Goldman suggests that, quote, with ghost catching, the dance of Bill T. Jones became virtual, moving in a sense beyond the body. How then, if at all, does the work hold on to its politics? Does ghost catching represent Jones's most radical formalist turn? Can politics transpire in a virtual dance that allows neither sweat nor skin, primary markers of labor and race, to appear on stage? End quote. Placing the work of Jones in conversation with that of Cunningham, Goldman emphasizes tension between politics and form when generating representations of human bodies and identities. Jones himself speaks to this tension and argues, contrary to Cunningham's formalist sentiments, that imaging technologies used to double dancers are never neutral. Now, rather than seek to neutralize technological representations, Jones calls for spectators to cultivate a, quote, double vision in which the who and how of each performance and performer are always already entangled. So Joan asks, quote, when you look at my stage now, can you look with two sets of eyes? Do you see the sexual preference of the person, the race of the person, the gender of the person? And then can you see what they're doing? End quote. So nearly a decade later, Jones's subsequent collaboration with the open-ended group titled After Ghost Catching inspired further questions regarding bodily representation and critical spectatorship. Addressing these two iterations of ghost catching from 1999 and 2010 respectively, dance scholar Tiffany E. Barber argues that a shift in American discourse from identity politics to post-racial ideologies served to reinforce purely formal interpretations of bodies and movement, stripped not only of identity, but of context. 
Problematizing abstraction as a means to neutralize representation, Barber argues that, quote, retreating to a digital body as a new sphere of sociality, as a utopian space that potentially and optimistically erases essentializing information or renders it invisible in order to escape the persistence of race as visual, does little to solve the problems of racialized looking practices. Significantly, political questions regarding identity and representation are largely absent in discourse surrounding the open-ended group's collaborations with Cunningham. And to this end, designer Paul Kaiser, who was integral to all of these collaborations mentioned thus far, states, quote, the virtual dancers in hand-drawn spaces appear as interchangeable sexless bodies. Political significations of sex and gender are disavowed. Whereas Cunningham's affinity for pure movement over identity politics and bodies as signs led him to explore motion capture technology for its formal qualities, Bilty Jones used the medium to different ends, end quote. But what are these different ends that Kaiser refers to? Jones has long been vocal in resisting binary interpretations of politics and form, arguing that politics are inherent within the flesh and movement of the performer, as well as the eye of the beholder. What are the implications then when movement becomes abstracted from the body of the performer as well as the context of capture? Are the implications different when we're speaking about Jones versus the dancers in Cunningham's work who I have yet to name? Are the digital bodies in these two pieces interchangeable with one another? And if not, why? In an article titled Additive Race, Colorblind Discourses of Realism in Performance Capture Technologies, Alison Reed and Amanda Phillips problematize approaches to representation that essentialize racial difference by treating it as a matter of style that could be divorced from and applied to virtual bodies interchangeably. Directing attention to the entire apparatus of production for performance capture, from the hardware and software to the designers and technicians, to the performers, directors, and audience, and then finally to the cultural and discursive context of capture, Reed and Phillips argue that, quote, no matter the self-identification of the gamers or performers themselves, the constraints of performance made possible in digital embodiment lead back to the identity of the avatar and the technicians who control it. It is not necessarily the identity of consumers that should concern us, but how these identities function in the context of wider discursive and technical systems that construct and constrain them. It is crucial to question the discourses of realism that surround motion capture technologies and the very representations they produce, which so often rely on the logics of white supremacy to ground reality in either the transparent universality of whiteness or the embodied specificity of people of color. This is what they call, quote, additive race, the reduction of racialized difference to a matter of style. So throughout the article, Reed and Phillips remind us that representation is a systemic process rather than a singular or enclosed operation. Thus, the interaction between a given performer with the motion capture system is never only a matter of translation between source and representation, but rather a complex and continual negotiation of intersecting value systems, aesthetic, ethical, and political. To this end, it is worth differentiating between the ap application of motion capture imagery to represent and interact with one's own avatar in solo performance versus the abstraction and interchangeability of multiple anonymized bodies as forms. Whereas live performance necessarily involves the non-uniformity of movement within differentiated bodies and identities, the intersection of computing with dance enables the datification and reduction of figures into undifferentiated forms, noting that categorical markers of difference may be reinscribed in avatars later on in order to signify realism. To explore this D and reinscription of character further, I invite you on your own time to watch each video a third time, but swap the music such that hand drawn spaces is accompanied by Jones's voice, and subsequently, ghost catching is accompanied by Kugula's music. What are the effects of this recoupling of movement and sound? 
How does this affect your interpretation of the identities of the avatars and the context in which they perform? There is much more to discuss here, but given the brevity of this talk, I'm going to leave you with those questions for later reflection and uh, move from discussing the use of motion capture for bodily abstraction and representation in performance uh, towards the use of motion capture in research-based and archival projects with choreographers. So yeah, in, in addition to the use of motion capture in production, it's been used to develop, develop numerous tools and resources aimed at transmitting aspects of choreographic process beyond the studio. Choreographer William Forsyth is featured in two very prominent projects in this vein that I will mention just briefly. So the first project, Improvisation Technologies, a tool for the analytical dance eye, is from 1999. It was developed by Forsyth in collaboration with media researchers at ZKM here in Germany. Forsyth describes his intent in this project as being to articulate the underlying logic and idiosyncrasies of his contemporary movement vocabulary to the classically trained dancers of the ballet Frankfurt. In a series of brief video clips originally released as a CD-ROM, Forsyth illustrates the way in which he visualizes and inscribes lines in space, progressing from simple tracing to more complex curves and architectures. And many of the clips are available on YouTube if you search. I'll share a very short video clip from Improvisation Technologies. And as you watch, I want you to keep in mind the abstract skeletal imagery in the motion capture projects with Bill T. Jones and Merce Cunningham that we just saw a moment ago. So interestingly, all three projects emphasize the reduction and abstraction of bodily movement into points and lines in space illustrating a Euclidean imaginary of geometric space, as well as Rudolf Laban's influential modeling of the kinesphere surrounding the body. Jumping ahead a decade to 2009, a second major project centered on Forsyth's work is Synchronous Objects, One Flat Thing Reproduced, which was de developed by Forsyth in collaboration with Maria Palazzi and Nora Zuniga Shaw at The Ohio State University, as well as several designers, engineers, and scholars from uh, research institutions and centers in uh, the United States and Germany. Uh, so a web-based project with later installations, Synchronous Objects employs an array of imaging technology to generate visual and three-dimensional interpretations of data derived from movement relationships in a video of the live choreography. And Forsyth and his collaborators refer to these derivations of the choreography as choreographic objects. And Forsyth explains that, quote, a choreographic object is not a substitute for the body, but rather an alternative site for the understanding of potential instigation and organization of action to reside. Ideally, choreographic ideas in this form would draw an attentive, diverse readership that would eventually understand and hopefully champion the innumerable manifestations, old and new, of choreographic thinking." End quote. So these choreographic objects, including interactive tools, can be explored on the Synchronous Objects website. Uh, and additionally, I'm going to share a short video that demonstrates several animations used to highlight complex choreographic structures in the spatial and temporal unfolding of the live choreography. In synchronous objects, data derived from a combination of quantitative and qualitative analysis of movement pathways, patterns, and relationships is represented by linear tracings on screen, as in the previous projects, but also by visual masses and textures subject to continual transformation. As expressed by Forsyth, Palazzi, and Zunika Shah in numerous talks and publications, Choreographic objects are not meant to represent the bodies or movement of the dancers, nor the choreography itself, but rather to make available seeds of ingrained choreographic thinking that may be transplanted into other disciplinary contexts. So the desire here to extract and transplant choreographic thinking resonates with numerous other practice-led research projects involving choreography and technology in 
the past decade and to point you towards just a, a few of the major ones. There's two projects with Wayne McGregor, Choreographic Thinking Tools and Choreographic Language Agent. Another significant project uh, was developed with Steve Paxton called Material for the Spine in collaboration with Baptiste uh, Andrian and Florian Coren for Contradance. And then the collective Badco made the Whatever Dance Toolbox which, with an HCI researcher. So there's a real range here from the projects with Wayne McGregor focused on cognitive science to uh, the movement research emphasis in Steve Paxton's work to the uh, sort of choreographic creative tools from the perspective of HCI and the Whatever Dance Toolbox. A few additional projects in this vein are the Siobhan Davies Replay Archive, directed by dance scholar Sarah Watley. Uh, also, a choreographer score, which was developed uh, by choreographer Anna Teresa de Kersemaker with performance theorist and music uh, musicologist Bojana Sevic. Uh, and then a uh, more transdisciplinary and uh, multi choreographer focused resource is the Transmedia Knowledge Base for the Performing Arts, uh, developed by linguist Carla Fernandez, um, based in Portugal with a team of researchers. And then finally, another uh, resource featuring multiple choreographers is Motion Bank, which was a project, again, at the Forsyth Company, co-directed by Scott de la Hunta and Florian Jeanette, uh, featuring choreographers Deborah Hay, Jonathan Burroughs, Matteo uh, Fergion, B.B. Miller, and Thomas Hart. And there's a, a second phase forthcoming, I believe, focused on annotation. Um, so this list is by no means exhaustive, but it is it serves to demonstrate the wealth of projects in the past decade aimed at making aspects of choreographic knowledge, primarily in the domain of contemporary performance in Europe, the UK, and the United States, uh, accessible and tangible to a broader audience. Owing in part to such initiatives, the notion of choreography has become increasingly divorced from its etymological roots as the writing of dance and applied to investigations of human and non-human movement at large. In a volume titled Transmission in Motion, The Technologizing of Dance from 2017, theater studies scholar Mikey Bleeker is joined by several artists and scholars to discuss approaches to the sharing of choreographic thinking, logic, and knowledge. In addition to detailed accounts from the collaborators in several of the projects discussed thus far, the volume touches on the legal, economic, political, and philosophical dimensions of these ventures. In a chapter titled Making Knowledge from Movement, some notes on the contextual impetus to transmit knowledge from dance, social anthropologist James Leach interrogates the motives behind framing choreography as a form of knowledge. Leach argues that, quote, in a context where value is seen not just in ability, but in the articulation of ability as knowledge, there is an understandable desire to represent skilled action as more than just technique or control. The dance is not just intuitive or primitive. That is, to represent skill and cre creativity in contemporary dance is a specific process of thinking and the outcome a form of knowledge. While nothing new, the impetus to see movement as containing knowledge now manifests in contemporary dance as an emphasis on choreographic practices as a particular kind of intelligence, one that, once rendered in other forms amenable to transmission and transaction, will be both visible and communicable as a contribution to wider cultural and economic development. So the troubling hierarchical distinction that Leach describes here between dance and choreography reflects deeply entrenched binaries in Western thought, such as body versus mind, practice versus theory, and material versus immaterial. Positioning the choreographer as the mastermind behind the performance and the dancer as the conveyor or interpreter of the choreographer's vision is an, is an assumption endemic to classical performance, and it warrants reevaluation in relation to contemporary practices of dance research, creation, and pedagogy. In many contemporary performance practices, the contributions of directors and performers are deeply entangled, such that creation involves distributed and cyclical exchange. And further, just as not all choreography centers on dance, many dance practices do not involve choreography, at least not in a directorial sense. So attributing choreographic knowledge to an individual choreographer 
fails to acknowledge the entire apparatus of sociopolitical, aesthetic, and technical production through which articulations of knowledge become visible and viable. Taking this into account, in a recent digital dance archive titled Dunham's Data, developed from 2018 to 2021, uh, the legacy of choreographer Catherine Dunham is examined genealogically through the visualization of data sets that trace interpersonal and geographic connections integral to her career and to dance history at large. Lead project investigators Kate Alswit and Harmony Bench explain that, quote, by manually cataloging a daily itinerary of Dunham's touring and travel from the 1930s to 60s, the dancers, drummers, and singers in her employ during that time and the repertory they performed, this digital archive aims to, quote, provide new means to understand their relationships between thousands of locations and hundreds of performers and pieces across the decades of Dunham's career, and ultimately elaborate how movement moves, end quote. Through a series of interactive visualizations, which you can access online, the diasporic evolution of Dunham's practice and pedagogy invites contextual and relational interpretations of her contributions to dance history. So the emphasis in Dunham's data on contextual information diverges from the visualization of aesthetic patterns within the creative process of individual choreographers. By casting this wide net around Dunham's work, however, this project enables interrogation of a broader apparatus of production through which knowledge emerges. So Catherine Dunham is honored here uh, not only as an individual, but through her relational significance in a complex of intersecting artistic, cultural, and sociopolitical forces, reminding us that representations of people and practices are never value-free. Uh, even when, or especially when, they are divorced from the bodies, identities, and context of emergence. The niche of dance and technology, which we've discussed from a few angles at this point, it must be understood in relation to the field of dance at large, as well as broader developments in technology across fields such as computer science, human-computer interaction, and science and technology studies. So ongoing developments in the area of dance and technology are increasingly concerned with critical methodologies and pedagogies to interrogate and ascribe bias within systems of capture and representation. And this, of course, reflects uh, growing awareness and cultural discourse surrounding inscribed bias in technology such as machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. So to this end, the folding of critical theory from feminist, queer, and decolonial perspectives into artistic research and creation in the area of dance and technology is imperative. Now, moving into the final section of this talk, I will consider what Marlon Barrio Solano refers to on the dancetech.net site as the unstable landscape of dance and technology. Uh, and in so doing, I will foreground some recent and ongoing initiatives. So gradually over the past decade and more dramatically in the past two years, the boundaries of dance technology have broadened such that it may no longer be appropriate to refer to it as a niche. In the context of the coronavirus pandemic, dance for camera and live stream performance have proliferated amplifying aesthetic and ethical concerns related to virtual embodiment, proximity, and intimacy. In many countries, art funding has been redirected towards adaptations of live work for screen, as well as project design specifically for online sharing. Experimentation with online formats such as one-on-one -on -one encounters, collective video montage, and durational events spanning hours or even days is increasingly common. In addition to curated festivals online, video sites such as YouTube and Vimeo, and social media platforms like TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook are flooded with work by independent dancers and choreographers, side by side with gifts of dancing hamsters. So at present, it's difficult to anticipate the impact that the pandemic or the pandemic-inspired saturation of technology and dance will have in the long term. Whether artists have turned to technology out of curiosity or necessity or some combination thereof, technical literacy within the field has certainly increased. 
And given advances in relatively affordable and user-friendly hardware and software, the exclusivity of dance and technology has been expanded by hands-on, DIY, and um, more collective dance text projects realized by dancers and choreographers themselves. So assuming access to the World Wide Web, which is a privilege still limited both geographically and economically, uh, individuals with the means need not wait for an invitation from a festival or venue to share work with audiences online. So this is a big part of these, this ongoing reconfiguration of boundaries. On open access video sites and social media, the role of the curator has been, to an extent, supplanted by algorithmic curation, or rather the human designers of these algorithms, which determine the relative visibility of content based on criteria such as views, likes, shares, and more. And to some extent, this more of algorithmic curation remains opaque and requires interrogation with regard to inscribed bias in implementations of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So as artists and art organizations attempt to hack these algorithms to increase visibility, it's worth considering if and how this is impacting the aesthetic of the work produced as well as the way in which it is framed and promoted. The smorgasbord of content encountered when scrolling online brings together materials that might otherwise be set apart based on cultural judgments of high versus low art and professional versus personal. Contextual analysis of dance and choreography encountered online necessitates tailored analysis of its site specificity. As Bench cautions, quote, these media bring all possible dance forms into the flattening space of the computer screen, blurring distinctions among movement practices and communities and disarticulating them from their histories and cultural situatedness or situations, end quote. This blurring makes it difficult to evaluate authorship and ownership of work on an individual and cultural scale, at least within existing frameworks for analysis in dance studies. And Bench explains further, Quote, the scholarship in dance studies continues to favor the explanatory framework of cultural appropriation to describe the spread of dances and movements beyond the communities invested in their production. This is due in part to the focus of much dance scholarship on the politics of modernist aesthetics and concert dance of the first half of the 20th century. Scholars have demonstrated that within this field, ideologies of openness and cultural fluidity rooted in the notion that dance is universal have historically favored those with greater social capital, end quote. So applying Bench's comments to the emphasis on transmitting choreographic knowledge from the practices of select 20th century choreographers in the projects discussed earlier, the ethical implications of abstraction and decontextualization come to the fore. Significantly, the inclusion of additional choreographers in such endeavors without a shift in methodology is not enough to decolonize representations of dance-based knowledge. As barriers to inclusion lessen, or at least shift, in online performance practices, participation may diversify, but this does not in itself constitute a reconfiguration of power dynamics within and between cultures of dance. The intervention of computational technologies in dance has largely served to reify and reassert the role of the choreographer vis-a-vis -vis dancers, amplifying tension already present within the field of dance itself. Dance scholar Jose Alrenoso argues that while the use of improvisatory, collective, and participatory techniques in contemporary performance is often characterized as democratic, the ethics underlying such approaches are questionable if they fail to distribute social capital in an equitable way. Speaking of participatory choreographies in recent years, Reynoso suggests that, quote, while these forms of labor intend to be more democratic because of the egalitarian ethos they seek to cultivate through more inclusive, collaborative, and less hierarchical compositional processes, the unequal distribution of various forms of capital produced by the participants' creative labor in acts while it naturalizes exploitative relational logics of capitalism. The argument contends that while choreographers strive with varying success to establish non-authoritarian creative practices in the production of their work, the collaborative bodies whose creative labor is crucial in the dance-making endeavor cannot claim authorship, 
nor ownership of the project, end quote. Ethical concerns related to attribution in contemporary dance are addressed by dance scholar Anthea Kraut in Choreographing Copyright, Race, Gender, and Intellectual Property Rights in American Dance, published 2015, and further by Charlotte Weld and Sarah Watley in a chapter of Transmission in Motion focused explicitly on copyright challenges in digital dance. Acknowledging hesitance on the part of many dance artists to engage with copyright law due to the collaborative nature of dance practice, Weld and Watley nevertheless emphasized the need to protect dance works legally as a form of cultural heritage in order to combat the perpetual threat of shrinking funding for individual artists and institutions in the UK and abroad. So this is indeed a form of activism. On the other hand, contrary to this emphasis on traditional copyright, much contemporary digital dance embraces the ethos of the creative commons, making work freely available online for reuse under certain conditions. In lieu of financial payment, work shed freely online may accrue social capital in terms of notoriety, networking, and future opportunities. In digital dance, the rising popularity of open source and open access platforms is perhaps a step towards acknowledging the distributed and diasporic emergence of contributions to knowledge that span disciplines and also generations. That said, the enduring effects of appropriation, colonialism, and systemic inequality in dance are not resolved, but rather displaced within Creative Commons licensing. So probing the values implicit within collective and open access approaches to digital dance, Bench points out that, quote, the ethics of these gestural transfers across cultures and movement communities are ambiguous. Digital cultural production as a global phenomenon thus requires a rethinking of how gestures and dances can circulate through media and across bodies without repeating the colonial violence of dispossession in the name of open access, end quote. This rethinking of ethics and aesthetics at the intersection of dance and technology is integral to the work of African-American studies and dance scholar Thomas F. de France. In a recent talk titled Improvising the Interface, Dance Technology and the New Black Dance Studies, de France emphasizes the entanglement of technology and aesthetics, as well as the reclaiming of technologies beyond their intended purpose as integral to dance as a means of protest and resistance. De France proposes that, quote, Black life and Black creativity is bound up with stylization, so style is super important. So we have ways, you know, communities of Black people gather around reanimating technologies, using them differently, using a phone differently, using a camera differently than, you know, essentially how it was designed to be used. Like, what else could it do? And let's stylize our relationship to technology. So these technologies do move way outside of the lab and outside of the theater space or the museum gallery into the nightclub, into the basketball game, into the football stadium. So maybe another way to think about it is how dance technology or interactive performance is actually distributed across kids' birthday parties or the liturgical dancing in churches. You know, it just comes out in different forms in different places than thinking it needs to be in a theater. End quote. So the stress here on the distributed character of dance and technology practices requires an embrace of multiplicity and malleability within contexts of presentation, such that the apparatus through which performances and interfaces are devised is subject to continual re reconfiguration both geographically and temporally. For de France, this research is grounded by collaborative initi initiatives in the lab he directs at Duke University called Slippage, Performance, Culture, and Technology. Uh, presently, transdisciplinary collectives, platforms, and research labs such as Slippage are integral to developments associated with dance and technology. Um, so through an interweaving of practice-based research with critical theory and philosophy, this is one uh, sort of venue in which teams of collaborators in the arts uh, and also across the humanities and sciences are probing the aesthetic and ethical dimensions of movement analysis and representation. So uh, to conclude this talk, I would like to point you in the direction of a few communities actively engaged with dance and technology uh, through which you can learn more and also get involved. The communities foregrounded here are, of course, a very partial sampling of the field, 
bound by my own uh, values, knowledge, and experience. And indeed, I am involved in several of these communities myself. Um, so for those curious about philosophical dimensions of bodily abstraction and representation, I recommend checking out the Meta Body Project, which was founded by Hamid al uh, and which hosts a yearly forum, as well as performances, installations, workshops, and talks internationally. Uh, additionally, the Sense Lab, directed by Aaron Manning, explores performance from the perspective of process philosophy and engages with issues of interaction and virtuality through reading groups, workshops, performances, as well as an open access journal and book series. Uh, mathematician and philosopher Shashin Wei has founded two research labs which focus on art, media, and engineering, namely the Topological Media Lab at Concordia University, now directed by choreographer Michael Montanero and philosopher David Morris, uh, and as well as the Synthesis Center at Arizona State University. Uh, the Synthesis Center currently supports a wide range of practice-based and theoretical projects on themes such as prototyping social forms, alternative economies and ecologies, and neurodiverse telematic embodied learning. And these ventures, again, involve uh, artists, also um, scholars and researchers across disciplines. The uh, yearly conference on movement and computing, MOCO, brings together practitioners in disciplines such as dance, music, human computer interaction, and computer science to explore areas such as computational study, modeling, representation, uh, etc. And in addition to providing open access proceedings, MoCo hosts an online forum and mailing list. Uh, now, in response to the pandemic, in 2021, MoCo was reimagined as an experimental durational event spanning an entire year it was called Slow Moco. It was chaired by Garrett Leroy Johnson, and it featured micro residencies, seminars, online discourse, and more, uh, all documented online. And although Slow Moco has officially concluded for now, the Discord channel remains active. So this is another uh, valuable place to look for resources and get involved. And then finally, I co-moderate an initiative called the Provocations Project uh, with my collaborators, John McCallum and Jessica Ryko. And this involves a series of ongoing open calls for provocations on questions integral to practices at the intersection of art and technology broadly. So uh, we hosted one call on the question of what escapes computation and interactive performance, and a following call on what aspects of your practice and research are invisible to your collaborators. So you can see the provocations received in response, as well as a series of curated and conversations between provocateurs, and also you can submit your own provocation on the website. And um, so this is one more entry point. Uh, and then finally, as I previously mentioned, dancetech.net is an excellent online community and resource. So given the current surge of new projects related to multimedia performance and dance, the above communities are a way to dip in uh, to find entry points into this ongoing flux of artistic and discursive developments in the field. I have painted some very broad strokes today to introduce critical themes and questions related to the history and practice of multimedia and dance over time. Uh, from the early 20th century to present day, intersections between dance and technology have at once magnified and intervened in cultural understandings of movement, bodies, and identities. But although Early integrations of technology and dance served to foreground select choreographers in the Euro-American Canada concert dance. The current proliferation of relatively affordable, user-friendly hardware and software, along with the constraints or perhaps opportunities of the pandemic, we find that these boundaries are beginning to shift, uh, even as issues of systemic inequality and inscribed bias persist therein. So in a few weeks, I will join my longtime collaborator, composer John McCollum, to give a second lecture as part of the Mutor Extended series. And the forthcoming talk is titled Politics, Identity, and Representation in Multimedia. It will take a more philosophical approach to questions that arise at the intersection of art and technology and go a little more deeply into some of what I discussed today. So thank you for joining me. I hope to uh, see you for the subsequent talk as well as other lectures in this series. And once again, thank you to Professor Dr. Georg Haidu and Dr. Xiaofu, as well as the entire MUTOR team and to Dr. 
Kirsten Everett, uh, with whom I shared this program. I would like to uh, also acknowledge the significance of my sustained collaboration with Jan McCallum and Jessica Ryko to my thinking in this talk, in particular through the reading and discussion group we co-moderate on issues of race, diaspora, and colonialism in practices at the intersection of dance and computing. So thank you to all members of the Dance Computing Studies uh, Research Group for contributions to the material and ideas foregrounded throughout this talk. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me via email. Thank you very much.